Thank you so much and welcome, friends. Uh, we've just come from a great session on the American founding in American democracy, and we're reminded that military history was central to the founders. Only if we study the history of past wars and the falls of past republics can we preserve America today. We're extremely fortunate to have two of America's great strategic thinkers who've written two important books about what we can learn from recent military history about uh, wars in the second half of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, and moving forward. And I'm so eager to share their wisdom with you so we can all learn from them together. General Petraeus, in your superb and important new book, uh, Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine, you argue that strategic leadership is central to whether wars succeed or fail. Tell us about your thesis. Yeah, this is the really big idea uh, in the book. Again, we cover a number of the conflicts, the most significant conflicts uh, since 1945. I have a co-author, the great Andrew Roberts, a brilliant British historian, now Lord Roberts of Belgravia, I might add as well. Um, and we lay out in the introduction the intellectual construct for strategic leadership. This is leadership at the very top that I actually used. I developed it between the three and four star tours in Iraq at the same time that we did the counterinsurgency field manual, and then we explicitly employed it uh, very consciously during that four star tour, then also at Central Command, Afghanistan, and, and the CIA, uh, and, and since then as well. I should note that I'm, I've been a uh, partner uh, in an investment firm, I have learned that the highest calling in life after government is the private equity industry. <laughs> <laughs> there are four tasks of a strategic leader. Uh, the first is to get the strategy right, get the big ideas right. You have to understand in the case of conflict, your forces, the enemy forces, the human terrain, the physical terrain, the neighborhood, all of this, and then get that right. In fact, We've failed to do this in a number of occasions, as we recount, 13 years in Vietnam it took us until we finally got the big ideas right. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, it took us about nine years to get all the inputs right after a brilliant initial campaign that toppled the Taliban and eliminated the Al-Qaeda sanctuary with a handful of special forces on horseback and CIA officers with footlockers of cash. If you get the big ideas right, then the task is to communicate them effectively throughout the breadth and depth of the organization so that everyone all the way down to the level of those under body armor and Kevlar with weapon outside the wire understand what the individual at the very top uh, intends for them to do. But you also have to communicate it to all everyone else who has a stake in the outcome of a conflict, whether it's America's mothers and fathers, those in the West Wing of the White House, Number 10 Downing Street, your host nation, uh, partners uh, in Baghdad or in Kabul and so forth. Then you have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. This is what we normally think of as leadership. This is the example the leader provides, the energy, the inspiration. Uh, it's the organizational architecture that you develop for the conduct of the campaign. They're all different. There's no single template that fits all. Uh, it's the metrics that you use. They have to be the right metric. Example back to Vietnam, uh, the body count metric was not only the wrong measure, uh, because we had the wrong strategy, it also then lacked integrity as the war went on, and that undermined a lot of the other uh, elements of, of combat and combat operations, including morale, frankly. Uh, you have to determine how you're going to spend your time. The battle rhythm is a crucial component uh, of this. Uh, the meetings you do, the, the visits you make, the patrols you go on, uh, all of this is how a commander actually drives the execution of a campaign plan. It also involves attracting the very best and brightest, hanging on to them as long as you can, and allowing those not measuring up to move on to something else. And then there's a fourth task that is facilitated by events on your battle rhythm, or forced by them in some cases, uh, and that is to sit down and determine how you need to refine the big ideas as the context evolves and so forth, uh, so that you can repeat the process again and again and again. And as I noted, we have some cases in which this was done very impressively. Uh, Maggie Thatcher, you know, it, it usually involves a fundamental decision by the political leader, i.e., this will not stand, as George W. Bush, or George H. W. Bush said about the Saddam's invasion of Kuwait at the very first meeting, and now the military has their orders. Okay, we got it. But then it has to be uh, operationalized, if you will, by the actions of the senior 
uh, military commander who's overseeing a particular campaign. This does work in the civilian world. I'll very, very quickly give you the example of Netflix from Reed Hastings, I think one of the great strategic leaders of our time, up there with Jack Ma and of Alibaba, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Four incarnations of Netflix. The first big idea is we're going to put movies in the hands of customers without brick and mortar stores, so we're going to charge less than Blockbuster does, and Blockbuster eventually goes out of business except for Bend, Oregon. Uh, which won't let us blockbuster die, and all of those, many of, of my age here, we can take our grandkids out there and show them what we used to do on a Friday night. Um, the, the second big idea is that he recognizes the context has evolved, and broadband speeds are so much quicker that now you can have people download uh, the movies. The third is we're going to make our own content, $100 million on House of Cards and a number of the other iconic series. And the fourth is, we're going to make major motion pictures and go head to head with the major studios. In fact, we're going to buy not one, but two studios to, to enable that. I've actually sat down with him. I've talked about this intellectual construct that I, I described that I used explicitly and that we use in the book to evaluate the quality of the strategic leader in these different conflicts. Um, and he actually had something very similar. I also, though, did have to note to him uh, that the movie in which Brad Pitt played my very close friend and combat comrade for nearly four <laughs> or five years, uh, Stan McChrystal, General Stan McChrystal, just didn't work. Brad Pitt was a stiff soldier. I mean, Stan had a sense of humor. Brad Pitt didn't. He did, saluted s s very stiffly, awkwardly. It just didn't work. But I also said that I just couldn't believe that Brad Pitt didn't hold out to play me. <laughs> in the sequel. Well, so, so powerful, the four big ideas, having a big idea, communicating it effectively, executing, and then refining in the face of other events. And your example of the Falkland Islands is so memorable. Maggie Thatcher was magnificent. Yes. You quote Ronald Reagan And so Reagan were the military saying, leaders, yeah. Absolutely. And that's why he wanted to give her everything that she yep. wanted, because he would support her. Uh, Jim Scudo, such an important thesis and warning about how the global order that persisted after the fall of the Cold War is now being uh, revised and is giving way to new uh, tripolar conflict between the US, Russia, and China. Tell us about the thesis. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to sit next to General and, David And Chase. the privilege in return. Well, the, he's the true strategic leader in that he's led forces in combat. I've had the privilege of reporting on them, but not, not taking uh, not taking the, the, the enormous responsibility that General Petraeus had for so many years. Uh, but thanks as well to you for, for having me and to all of you for taking time out of your afternoon. Uh, so this, the idea for this book came to me when I was in Ukraine in February 2022, covering the beginning of the Russian invasion, the second invasion, but the full-scale one, uh, watching the tanks come across the border, watching the first cruise missiles land on Ukrainian cities, and it struck me in that moment that this was a clean break between the relative peace that all of us had enjoyed since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. It was not the first sign by any means. Russia had sliced off a piece of Georgia in 2008. It sliced off two pieces of Ukraine in 2014. I was there for that as well. But the, the, the brazenness of sending the bulk of your conventional military forces to attempt to absorb Europe's largest country by population by force of arms was to me, uh, despite the deterioration prior, uh, we, we, had, we had fallen into the abyss of, of, of a new conflict. Uh, that's my theory, and, I, and on the air at the time I said this is a 1939 moment because it's a test as well for how the world reacts to this, how Ukraine certainly does, but how Ukraine's allies, and crucially, how we, America, and our allies, not just in Europe, but around the world react to it. Uh, in the book, I, I, I spend a lot of time in Ukraine. I, I go to Eastern Europe, to the Baltics, up to the Baltic Sea. I also go to Taiwan, which I'll get to in a moment, because I believe those two issues are very much connected. Uh, and I spent a good deal of time with the Estonian Prime Minister, Kaya Kalas. If, if you've seen her on the air, she to me, and I, I'm, I'm sure General Petraeus yeah. has spent time with her, is one of the most impressive world leaders I've ever met. Tough as nails, and, and a, a superb expression of, of, of just the Baltics. Here, here, here are tiny states, particularly Estonia, Estonia, right on Russia's border, who only a generation ago were under the yoke 
of Soviet power. They get, got their independence only in 1991. They know what it's like to live under Russia, and they also know what the Russian threat is. She says consistently, we are next for uh, Russia. We are in Russia's next targets. And the, the Med Medvedev said in the last 24 hours, the Baltic states don't exist. They speak about the Baltics much the way they speak about Ukraine. Does not exist based on their ancient maps that they've dug out of the basement of the Kremlin, etc. Listen to what they say because they tend to follow through. She often quotes Churchill from 1939 on the crocodile. Uh, an appeaser is the one who feeds the crocodile hoping that he or she will be its last meal. And, and, and that construct struck me and still does to this day as true, that it's a test. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and all the slaughter we've seen play out in the two years since is a test not only for Ukrainians, but for us, for our allies in Europe and as far away in Asia. I went to Taiwan for this book. Uh, I've been there before, but spent a lot of time there researching this. And everybody I met in Taiwan, political leaders, Navy commanders, Army commanders, commanders of fighter squadrons say, what happens in Ukraine is consequential for us. Because if the world lets that happen, we're next, their next target. And by the way, and I'm sure General Petraeus knows this better than me, they're also learning war, lessons of war there for what works to defend yourself asymmetrically, as is China. China is watching our reaction, the world's reaction, and also what they can learn for how to absorb a smaller adversary. That's the thesis of the book, and that's, that's how I came to it. Let me just I'd say I strongly that, yeah. agree with the thesis, actually. Yeah. In fact, um, we have a thesis, again, in my day job, uh, doing geopolitical risk, essentially, for one of the world's largest investment firms, that the world has transformed over the past decade from one that could be described as benign globalization, uh, in which barriers to trade, investment, data, and so forth were all going down, and trade was going like this, and economics was driving geopolitics to an era of renewed great power rivalries, in which all of those barriers have been going back up. There is conflict around the world, uh, and geopolitics is now driving uh, economics. I also very strongly agree, we make the point in conflict that what happens in one part of the world reverberates in others. Uh, if we fail, for example, to provide continued assistance to Ukraine, it will send a very, uh, very uh, negative message uh, when it comes to deterrence in the Indo-Pacific, keeping in mind that deterrence is a function of two elements. The potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities on the one hand, and your willingness to employ them on the other. In fact, I think that our withdrawal from Afghanistan, when we hadn't even had a lost a soldier in 18 months and only had about 3,500 there, easily sustainable, sent a message to Putin that, you know, we Americans probably aren't going to respond uh, as strongly as we actually have. Um, and then uh, finally, I'd also add another Churchill quote, uh, it's more relevant to Ukraine, uh, that it's hard to negotiate with a lion when your head is in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. Well, let me ask Jim, um, the 1939 rule is mm. strong throughout your book and the need to respond to autocratic offenses or else they'll ask for more uh, is crucial. Judged by that standards, um, are most of the big wars that America has fought in the 20th and early 21st century, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and uh, Iraq, um, were they justified strategically or not? Personally, no. I, I mean, well, there are three different wars you mentioned there. Uh, I didn't cover Vietnam, uh, but l looking back, I mean, it's, let me get to that in a moment. I'll do Iraq and Afghanistan first. Uh, Afghanistan, response to 9-11, how could you not go and, and destroy the force that killed so many of us and, and was a continuing force, not just threat, rather, not, not just to America, but to our allies and to the world and the ideology and so on, all that it enabled. Uh, what your goals were after that initial uh, operation, what you were attempting to build there, it seemed like there was some mission creep and so on. That, that, that creates other questions down the, down the road. Iraq, I, I don't, um, I, you know, you know the trumped up threat that was, that was uh, used to justify that in part and, and the progress of that war. I think that that's a, that's a relatively easy one. Vietnam, I, I just, I, I want to go to that one last because folks have asked me as I've been doing interviews for this book, it kind of sounds like you're positing a new domino theory, right? You know, that 
If you let Ukraine fall, then here come the Baltics, and, and there's Taiwan, and that kind of thing. And it, General Petraeus is a better historian than me, military historian. But my, my answer to that question is that, is that this one is a real dom domino theory, right? And we know historically that we misread the Soviet Union on Vietnam and so on, and, and arguably got involved in a, in a civil war, at reading, reading consequences from that that weren't uh, there necessarily supported by history. I, I do believe that, that what, and, and by the way, we have some recent history to back that up, right? That, you know, Putin has grabbed territory in Europe prior, particularly in, his, in, in the old, uh, well, the near abroad of the Soviet Union, done it, like I said, in Georgia, Ukraine prior, and now this attempt, and he has his sights set elsewhere. So we have some recent history that, that backs up the idea that he's not just gonna stop here, right? And you can't negotiate your way out of it. And when you look at China, listen, you know, if you believe the US intelligence assessments, China, she wants his military to be ready by 2027. Uh, to take it, whether he does it by then, don't know, but he certainly wants the option. I do believe that there is a far more credible case and evidence based on the thinking of the leaders, the moves they made, Xi and Putin, that there is, I don't want to call it a domino theory, but that, but that in effect those dominoes are connected. General Petraeus, you served with great distinction in Iraq and Afghanistan, and in this really important book, you argued that U.S. interventions in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq failed by the measure of the strategic leadership pillars that you identify. Were those not, failures- Not Iraq necessarily, I can explain well, that. Exp explain and tell, yeah. tell us, sure. were, were they failures of uh, st st uh, strategy or execution or, or both? Mm. Uh, strategy, uh, but, but let me give a little more nuance than that. Uh, Vietnam, we come in after the French have lost at Dien Bien Phu. By the way, talk about a bad strategic idea. Uh, they're frustrated they can't get the Vietnamese communists, really nationalists as well, to, to join them in battle. This is French and Indochina. So they decide we'll create this huge base right at the edge of our air capacity and capability. Uh, it's going to be dependent on air for re, uh, resupply and a big, huge runway that they build. Yeah, it's surrounded by hills and mountains, but they refuse to believe that the Vietnamese will actually be able to get artillery up on those and threaten these airfields. Vietnamese take them apart one by one, reassemble them at the top of the hill, and they just start hammering, and they just essentially lay siege to the Bien Phu. Eventually, they can't get the reinforcements in uh, and all the rest of that, and they have to surrender. Uh, there's a peace agreement after that, uh, and it partitions North and South Vietnam. We uh, show up on the scene. The South Vietnamese say, we have a problem with security in our villages and hamlets. Can you help us with that? This is much more, in, if you will, counterinsurgency than large units. We say, no, we're fresh from Korea. Let us tell you what you need to worry about. This is just like Korea, we said. Uh, you need to have eight divisions or so that can hold off the North Vietnamese coming across the new demilitarized zone. That really was not the threat at the time. It was a total misreading. And we kept focusing on the big war all the time. When we brought our forces in, we never, ever really invested in security of the people, which is what we should have done from the outcome, and make the enemy come to you. The Marines did do this, by the way. The Marines just did on their own, broke up into small units, lived with the people. That's the only way you can secure them. Classic counterinsurgency approach. And the results pr are proven that that's what we should have done, but General Westmoreland in particular didn't want to hear it. And it was not until late 1968 when General Abrams takes over that you finally have a joined up comprehensive Vietnamese, U.S. coalition, embassy, CIA, all together uh, embark on a comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign. By that point, after Tet, uh, U.S. public opinion had eroded to the point that it was just not sustainable. And a very different war in a lot of ways from Afghanistan, uh, which I would submit was sustainable even at the end. 3,500 troops if you haven't lost a soldier and 25 billion out of a $850 billion defense budget at the time is very sustainable. Um, so Vietnam ultimately, uh, again, we just had to withdraw. You can, I do think, I mean, the domino theory, there was some merit to this. There was some logic to it. And there are those that uh, would like to see Vietnam as having accomplished something. Uh, certainly, I think, can point to the fact that a number of countries in Southeast Asia had the time and the opportunity to develop, to evolve, and to strengthen in ways that enabled them subsequently to, to keep the uh, domino theory such as it was uh, uh, isolated to the several countries in Southeast Asia. But again, it was a failure 
I think the military had every opportunity to get it right. Uh, the Kennedy, Johnson, ultimately Nixon administrations gave them the, the, the uh, space to do that, and we just did not do that. Uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, brilliant initial campaign, as I mentioned, and then we took our eye off of it because we focused uh, on Iraq. We squandered years of very, very low levels of violence. Um, with respect to you know, the mission creep, you had to do nation building. We'd broken it. You own it. And the only way you can actually withdraw or, or th thin out your forces, reduce them, uh, is to build up host nation security uh, capabilities and host nation critical institutions. But we didn't focus on that sufficiently really until about the end of the first year of the Obama administration. Uh, so we, as I said, we didn't get the big, not only did we not get the big ideas right for about seven years, we also didn't get the other inputs right for nine years. And I actually was the commander when finally we got just about the forces we need, had the right organizational architecture finally, uh, generally had uh, reasonable levels of the diplomatic uh, development, intelligence, and other partners required, uh, and so forth. Uh, but we had squandered years. And then the challenge was, of course, that you had sanctuaries in, Af in uh, Pakistan uh, that the Pakistanis allowed the Taliban and the Haqqani Taliban to, to occupy uh, and didn't, would not allow us to go after them in there. That was the single biggest challenge of that. But the truth is that however frustrating and maddening the situation was uh, when we decided to withdraw, that was, actually was sustainable. Sustainability, the big idea is it, it's, it's what is the cost in blood and treasure? And we could have sustained that very easily. Yes, it was not what we hoped it would be. Yes, our partners were uh, equal parts, feckless, corrupt, and, and so forth, but that was a far better situation uh, for the Afghan people than clearly what has followed, which is a return to a seventh or eighth century interpretation of ultra-conservative Islam in which half the population can't even go out of the home without a male guardian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Iraq is a, is a bit more of a hybrid. Initial campaign, I was a two-star general, the division commander of the great 101st Airborne Division at the time. That campaign w went much more rapidly than was expected, but we had a terrible post-success uh, plan there. Uh, in fact, the organization that was supposed to do that really didn't even, it got fired within three weeks when Rumsfeld was frustrated. I should note, I asked uh, down at the in Kuwait before we launched the invasion at the final gathering of commanders. I said, excuse me, could you just give us a little bit more detail on what happens after we get to Baghdad and topple the regime? And one of the retired three stars <laughs> who was overseeing this organization for reconstruction humanitarian assistance said, Dave, you just get us to Baghdad, we'll take it from there. Well, that didn't work out too well. In fact, we got halfway to Baghdad, we took the first big city. I called up my boss and I said, hey boss, I got good news and bad news. Good news is we own Najaf. What's the bad news? We own Najaf. What do you want us to do with it? Uh, and he said, call those guys in Orha, you know, and first the phone didn't, then no one answered. Then they finally said, no, we're still getting organized. And then we compounded that by the organization that replaced Orha, the Coalition Provisional Authority. The leader of that comes in who had never spent time in the ground, never talked to those of us who had already been there for months now. I already had a government up in Mosul. We were already training host nation forces, et cetera. And they decide his first act is fire the entire Iraqi military without telling them how we're going to enable them to provide for their families. And then compounded that by firing the Ba'ath Party. Look, we needed to fire the top levels of the Ba'ath Party, Saddam, his son. We killed his sons actually in Mosul when they refused to surrender. But when you go to level four as they did, these are the bureaucrats, most of them Western educated, I might add, uh, that we actually needed to run a country that we didn't understand adequately. Uh, so it was a huge crippling, these two decisions. I was given authority to do reconciliation, and I did it on my own, and it worked great, but then it was ended by the Iraqis after I left as a two-star. Then we actually got it, then we finally put an embassy on the ground, then we had a four-star, we got the right organizational architecture, generally the right big ideas, but they were invalidated in 2006 when there was a terrible bombing of a Shia shrine in a Sunni-occupied area, a Sunni-majority area, and they'd always protected it in the past, and it set off a cycle of violence that forced President Bush to make the decision to conduct a surge, which was not supported, by the way, by most of the senior military uh, at the time. Um, in fact, one of them said, Mr. President, I'm afraid you might break the service. And he said, General, I'll tell you what will break the service, losing a war, and he was right. And so we embarked on the surge, additional forces, but the surge that mattered most was the surge of ideas. It was a complete reversal of what we had been doing. 
Uh, and I should note that, you know, between, and I, I had a three-star tour there as well, but between the three and four-star tours, we created the counterinsurgency field manual, overhauled preparation of our forces, everything else, so that when we went in, that's what we implemented. And it was, again, 180 degrees different. We went back into the neighborhoods. We lived with the people. We created gated communities. We secured them. Um, we decided to embark on reconciliation. You can't kill or capture your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. The irreconcilables we pursued even more relentlessly with our special operations forces, very much joined up civil military. In fact, we had a civil military campaign plan signed by both the ambassador and me, and we drove violence down by nearly 90%, and it stayed down. So we got it right. It was working well. It stayed down for three and a half years until we withdrew our final combat forces, and within 24 hours, the prime minister pursued highly sectarian actions that started to tear the fabric of society again that we'd put back together eventually. Then they took their eye off the Islamic State. It was able to reconstitute. A lot of lessons in there for other places, including, by the way, uh, with respect to Hamas, because preventing them from reconstituting is going to be a very, very challenging task. Wow. Well, it's so powerful. You use that phrase, surge of ideas, and you show so vividly that uh, the political dimensions of the uh, occupation are so crucial, and that uh, Paul Bremer's decision to fire tens of thousands of Athos. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds, yeah. of thousands. Hundreds of thousands in the military, and then many, many tens of thousands of the bureaucrats. And we already had all these people working for us, and it was going really well up in Mosul. We, we'd reopened the international airport, we'd reopened the international border. General Powell, Secretary Powell by that time said, oh, Dave, so now you have your own foreign policy too. I said, hey, sir, you know, I, I did tell my higher headquarters if they didn't pass it on to you, sorry about that. Um, but it was going really, really well. We actually did two investment banking deals. I mean, there were two derelict hotels. We invited investors in. Uh, one of them, I think one of them we got 13 million for and the other was about 15 or 17. So there are all kinds of initiatives going on. We had mostly university reopened, uh, people back at work, um, and then it, that just cut us off at the knees. And it, it really was what pushed tens of thousands of individuals into the insurgency because we always had a sign on the wall in my command centers uh, as a two star, three star, four, 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 that asked a question, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? If the answer to that is no, in other words, you're gonna create more bad guys because of the way you do the operation, even if you take somebody off, that is one where you should, you're supposed to go sit under a tree until the thought passes, uh, or re-engineer it so that you get to yes. It's a really crucial, uh, crucial question. Bremer's decisions, both of those, violated that massively, uh, and it really set us back for really quite a period of time. Jim, you argue that standing by Ukraine is crucial for the future of the uh, international order. Uh, tell us why and what we can learn from history about that. All right, so listening to the general describe Iraq and Afghanistan, just, just a point and a difference. There are no U.S. boots on the ground in Ukraine, right? I mean, there, there's some clandestine, but you do not have tens of thousands of forces fighting this war, right? It is uh, the U.S. aiding Ukraine to defend itself with a tiny fraction against of its, a common enemy against a common enemy yep. with a tiny fraction of its defense budget wherein all the money that is currently being debated on the hill to to add to ukraine's defense the largest portion of it is going to come back to the u.s because those are u.s defense contractors that are supplying many of the weapons and the munitions right so the the difference you know the, the, the wars have a lot of commonalities right uh, you got a bad guy uh, who does not have your interests in heart russia uh, russia the taliban and al-qaeda in afghanistan and uh, various nefarious forces in iraq uh, but this is not an american boots on the ground operation that's a fundamental difference and, and i think it often gets lost in the debate right um, there are dangers there are real dangers of escalation which, which should not be uh, eliminated. I think you could make a good argument that they have at times been exaggerated, right? That sometimes we, we look at Russia as 10 feet tall and more threatening than they are. I talk a lot about in the book. Now, first of all, I do talk in the book about a, a period in late uh, summer, early fall 2022, when the U.S. was genuinely concerned that Russia was going to use a tactical nuclear weapon. They were on their back foot. They were losing ground in the south. And this led to a 
global campaign, including enlisting the support of China and India to, to pull Russia back from the brink. So I'm not saying the risks of escalation are nil, because they are real, whether, but I think, and I, and I talk to a lot of folks in this book who say that at times you, you can overestimate that risk, and, and I think you can make a good argument that this administration overestimated the risk of escalation in terms of slow walking some of the weapon systems and capabilities at certain times. Um, so I, I just think that that difference is key, yep. right? Because you have a common enemy w w in Russia, common, the US and its European allies that is killing civilians, right? I mean, it's, it's committing murder every day deliberately and trying to absorb a country in Europe and trying to violate a principle that has helped keep the peace to all of our benefit for 80 some odd years, which is borders matter, right? Sovereignty matters. I'm not saying the US has a perfect record on that by any means, we do not. But we do not invade and absorb countries uh, and call them our own and say they don't exist and so on. We don't do that. This is, this is a different threat from Russia and I think similarly from China. So you have a real national threat, uh, national security threat to the U.S. in Russia and in China. You have a low to nil investment of U.S. blood in those wars. Ukrainian blood beyond our imaginations, but not U.S. boots on the ground, and a relatively small piece of the national budget to accomplish something that is consequential. And the final point I would make is this, is that it is not just a goodwill argument to help the Ukrainians def defend themselves. And I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine, and General Petraeus has as well. They are good people. They're smart people. Uh, they want to be closer to Europe. They do not want to be under Russian control. They don't. Um, that, that to me is a, is, a, is a moving argument as an American and, a, and an insufferable idealist. But it's not the only argument because Russia and China want to tear down what is dear to us, um, a system that we have all benefited from, not just in our own security, but in other things. Uh, free movement of trade through Asian shipping lanes, a, a, a healthy, vibrant Europe, which is a major trading partner. Also things that we don't really think about. We, we can go to Prague now without even thinking about it. Our kids can do study abroad in Eastern Europe without even thinking about it. That was not, when I was a kid, that was not an option, right? That was behind the wall. Um, you used to be able to do that in China, right? Although I lived in China for two years with my family, and I think I have some old colleagues in the audience here. They said they were going to be here. There they are, uh, working in the State Department. Most of my friends who lived and worked there at the time have left China because precisely because it's become more hostile. But you know, we have a lot of benefits as well from making the stand right now, and that's the argument I would make. Yeah, this is not charity. This is about no. our cold, hard national interest, and national security, and frankly, prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, and other countries in the world do not want to see the perpetuation of the system that we and our allies and partners have worked so hard to establish since the end of World War II, the so-called rules-based international yeah. order. They'd like to create a system that tolerates what they do and how they operate, and that includes invading your neighbor if you have a revanchist, revisionist, mm -hmm. and grievance-filled view of the world, as does uh, Vladimir Putin. And, and again, killing he, your opponents, right? He, he will Wherever not stop there. Wherever he wants to in the world, not just yep. in Russia as he did, yes, but, but sure. in London with yep. Litvinenko yep. Uh, in Europe. Yep. And, and by the way, yep. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens here in the States. It, he will not stop there. I mean, Moldova would be next, then Lithuania, the other Baltic states, and mm -hmm. so forth. And then now we're into NATO countries, and that, that's particularly concerning. Well, you both agree about the urgent need to maintain this bipartisan consensus of uh, defending uh, uh, Europe and, and NATO against Russian aggression. Jim, in your last chapter, you have a powerful argument that uh, Donald Trump rejects this bipartisan consensus mm -hmm. and in expressing a preference for authoritarian uh, dictatorships over democracies, the threatening to pull out of NATO and to abandon the world order, he poses a serious challenge to world uh, peace. Tell us more about that argument. So whatever your politics, if Trump is reelected, he will reverse decades old, bipartisan U.S. foreign policy on a number of fronts. And, and I'm, I'm not making that up or guessing. That, that's what his former, most senior advisors tell me. I talked to John Kelly, was his chief of staff. John Bolton was his national security advisor. Matt Pottinger, who was his uh, deputy national security advisor with a particular focus on Asia. Um, they say that a second Trump term, 
And again, these are quotes from the book. Uh, I'm not going to try to sell the book, but you want to read this chapter. Uh, you, uh, you, you buy it out here, you can buy it at Amazon. You want to read this chapter because it describes how these things are connected. It's not just Trump talking, which he likes to do, and saying sometimes offensive, sometimes silly things. He has a worldview which is fundamentally different. NATO, he will pull the U.S. out of NATO, and it, I know that legislation has been passed that that requires congressional approval, but he can neuter NATO without formally signing a piece of paper because he's commander-in-chief. If he doesn't defend an eastern-facing NATO ally, if he says, Russia, you could do whatever the hell you want, which, by the way, is a direct quote, uh, then, in effect, that, I mean, to, to the general's point, deterrence is about credibility as well. He can do that. They say he has no interest uh, he wants to reduce the U.S. commitments to defend South Korea, reduce U.S. Commitment, commitments to defend Japan. He wants closer relationships with Putin, uh, Xi Jinping, and others, and believes somehow that by sheer force of personality, he can make a deal that serves, well, his interests, arguably, but, but also our interests, which, which I believe, and smarter folks than myself believe, is just fundamentally not fact-based, because those countries have a strategic interest in undermining the U.S. So you could be the best negotiator in the world, you're not going to negotiate them away from their core strategic beliefs. The final point I will make is this, and John Kelly tells very detailed anecdotes uh, in my book about how Trump expressed admiration for Hitler. Straight up. John Kelly, four-decade retired Marine general, go, served in all the wars back to and including Vietnam, gold star father, lost his son, as General Petraeus knows, uh, on a patrol to an IED in Afghanistan, a trustworthy guy. And he describes how Trump repeatedly said, well, Hitler did some good things. What good things, General Kelly says. He says, well, he rebuilt his economy, General Kelly said, to which General Kelly says, rebuilt his economy to weaponize it against Europe and, and invade Poland and wage war against our allies. And by the way, Mr. President, 400,000 U.S. GIs died in the European theater defending him. And he said, well, but at least his generals were loyal to him. I, he didn't get the kind of guff you're giving me here. And he said, well, actually, Mr. President, his generals tried to assassinate him multiple times. <laughs> it's silly. It's not fact-based. It's made up, as we often hear for, from Trump, but it's, it's ingrained right? And, it, and it's tied. The, the, the idea that he could see Hitler is okay and Putin is a guy I can work with and Xi Jinping, you did the right thing by imprisoning million, hundreds of thousands, more than a million Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, is the way he sees the, the world. And, and he does not see the U.S. as any better in these conflicts than they are, which, by the way, he has said as well. You'll remember his interview with Bill O'Reilly a number of years ago. That is, however that makes you feel, doesn't make me feel good as an American, it's not the way I see my country, it also has deep consequences, would have deep consequences for how the U.S. operates in the world. Um, it's worth reading the chapter because these guys who were in the room with him face to face as he made these decisions, including nearly pulling the U.S. out of NATO at the summit in uh, 2018, they describe how his mind works on these things, and it would mean major consequences for you and me. General, it's a, it's, a it's a strong thesis that uh, Donald Trump, by rejecting the distinction between authoritarian and democratic governments and expressing preference for authoritarianism, threatens the world order. Do you agree or not? Look, I have, first of all, I should just note for the audience, I don't even register to vote, so I am as non-political as is possible. I'm not just bipartisan or nonpartisan. Um, and I, I stopped when I was promoted to two stars. I thought I should be non non-political, and I've stayed that way to the extent that I can. Um, second, I just make a point that what Trump was, was right about with NATO, which was every other mm -hmm. president emphasized as well, is that NATO needed, to, Europeans needed to do more for NATO. And the irony is they now are. Yeah. So I was at the most recent Munich Security Conference. I've been going to those off and on uh, since I was a major a speech writer for the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Uh, and the refrain every year until this one was the Americans are serious and the Europeans are not as serious as they should be. This year, ironically, the Europeans are serious. Mm -hmm. The EU just committed another $50 billion collectively, and each country is, is really stepping up to the plate. More, the, more of them than ever in the post-Cold War period are 
spending the 2% of GDP on defense that is the NATO uh, standard and so forth. Uh, so it's actually happening, and yet we are the ones this time that we're seen as not being sufficiently serious because of the course uh, the Senate passed uh, support for Ukraine was languishing in the, in the House uh, because of a handful of individuals who have the speaker to a degree hostage. Um, so that is actually a development. And then in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, Japan has, is doubling its defense spending in a five-year period. That's the number four economy of the world, Germany have, having surpassed them. Germany is stepping up in ways that have never been seen before. So we're finally actually having our allies and partners do what we want. And the last thing we obviously would want to do is, is to undermine that uh, or to undermine deterrence by a seeming lack of will on our part, keeping in mind again that deterrence rests on enemy, uh, potential adversaries assessment of your capabilities and your willingness to employ them. That will piece is the crucial component. Um, there's a reason why President Biden has seemingly slipped up four different times and said we'll come to the rescue of mm -hmm. Taiwan, uh, and it's because I think he's trying to reinforce that particular element even though his national security advisor then rushes out and says there's no change to our policy of uh, uh, strategic ambiguity and so forth and so on. Um, I worry about institutions. I think our, what has kept our country uh, great again and again and again is the strength of institutions uh, in the face of individuals that have sought to, to counter or to undermine those institutions. We have watched what has happened in Hungary. We watched what happened in Poland. Uh, Ann Applebaum chronicles this, I think, particularly powerfully, especially because she's married to what is who the individual is now the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Poland actually at the polls reversed it. Now they're going to see if they can restore the freedom of press, the uh, independent judiciary. The other, these are institutions. Hungary, on the other hand, has actually successfully undermined all of those, and they're all largely controlled by Orban, uh, the individual who's been in power longer than any other leader in, in Europe. Um, the, the he muzzles the media, he withdraws advertising from it, and eventually they have to sell and he gets one of his buddies to buy it, and so there goes freedom of the press. Uh, the judiciary is now in the grip uh, of them and he's controlled the parliament. Uh, again, that's not a good position, and my worry is actually about institutions. It is about uh, if someone doesn't do what the leader uh, wants that individual to do, uh, they either get fired or uh, what have you, or you just have such loyalists in these positions that no one will challenge. I felt very strongly that uh, as a senior, as a four star and as a CIA director, so the, this is four Senate confirmed serious positions, two under a Republican, two under a Democrat, that you, know, you get paid for speaking truth to power. Mm. Uh, I was not always popular at the Situation Room table as a result of that. In fact, Secretary Gates writes in his memoirs that he thought he was going to have to throttle me at one point uh, <laughs> as I was insistent. You know, but I looked around the table, and there's no one else at that table who had actually done what we were talking about doing, and I'd done it in multiple uh, tours. And so, uh, again, I think it's crucial. But if you don't have individuals in position who are willing to tell truth to power, uh, and I fear that that would be another uh, potential consequence, uh, then I think you, you start to see the institutions crumble. Uh, and they, they held previously, mm -hmm. but in some cases uh, it was quite tenuous for a moment of time. Such an important warning about the urgent importance of defending our democratic institutions. Jim, last word in this illuminating discussion is to you, you end by calling on the U.S. to engage in a kind of constructive engagement with Russia yeah. and China, always enforcing the 1939 rule, but uh, engaging where appropriate. Tell us what that might look like and how we might find some possible grounds for optimism. Just, just a personal note, I, I've got a 15 and 13-year-old sons. They, they, they would be of draft age in a minute in, in a great power conflict. I, I have no desire or taste for, for goading our country into war, rooting, rooting country into war. And I, so I deliberately uh, focused the last chapter. I, I asked everybody I interviewed for this book uh, around the world, Taiwan and Estonia and you name it, military, intel, uh, prime ministers, give me some ingredients to avoid this becoming a hot war. Bill Burns and others as well. Um, I, I'm not going to, you know, claim to be able to either in the book or in this one minute uh, crystallize all of those. But 
Clearly, there are areas where you can work together and have to. Climate change is the obvious one with China because you can't do climate change without the two largest polluters in the world somehow working together. And there's some evidence that that's possible. And this sort of temporary rapprochement between Beijing and Washington, which probably, you know, is likely, I mean, arguably short term because it's responding to some domestic issues in China. I mean, there are longer term things that have not gone away. It does show you that you can communicate. Bill Burns talks a lot about the importance of maintaining uh, communications, both at the military level and at the diplomatic level, to prevent small encounters from escalating into something bigger. And then the final note I, I would say is that uh, a lot of folks hearken back to 1962, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and, and just a story that stuck in my mind that, that JFK, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, made sure that every member of his cabinet read The Guns of August, which had come out earlier that year, Barbara Tuckman's book about the slide into World War I. And, and there's a great quote it, at the time where Kennedy said, uh, to his brother, Robert F. Kennedy, he said, I don't want someone to someone de someday write a book, The Missiles of 1962. He didn't want to be at the center of allowing or, or somehow not preventing his country from sliding into great power war. And I think all of us, and, and by the way, we as, we as members of the public have a piece in this too, because we're going to be choosing candidates, we're going to be asking our lawmakers and leaders questions before they make these decisions. God, God knows a strategic, strategic thinker like General P Petraeus with the influences he has, we all have agency in finding the processes and the communications uh, so that we avoid that slide, so that we don't write a book about the, I don't know, the nukes of 2024. No one wants to read that book. Absolutely, you make a, such an urgently important point about the need to learn from history and both Barbara Tuckman and JFK and you remind us that unless we study the military and political and strategic history of the world, we're doomed to repeat it. For reminding us of that lesson, please join me in thanking our authors. Thank you.